Okay, God save the king. <laughs> well, people, sorry for the delay. Today we talk about a little bit about petroleum production in geology. Uh, geologists, geophysicists, and engineers share the responsibility of oil production in the oil industry. So one can ask, what is the relationship between stratigraphy and oil production? Hello everybody, I'm Magal, and today we'll talk about this. Just in case anyone would like to contact me, please write down my email. It will also be available at the end of this talk. Reservoirs are those rocks that contain the oil to be produced in an oil field. As the reservoirs are not homogeneous, we subdivide it into zones and manage their production. The oil production has a straight correspondence with the economic outcome. So what is our reservoir zone? And why are they so crucial to the production strategy of a field? That is drilling wells, completions, facilities, forecast production and profitability. It is because the flow of fluids and oil productions comes from the zone. So the subdivision of a reservoir into flow units provides a practical means for reservoir zonation that makes use of both geological and petrophysical data representing heterogeneity observed at several scales. Thus, a flow unit is defined as a mappable portion of the, the reservoir within which geological and petrophysical properties that affect the flow of fluids are consistent and predictably different from the properties of other rock volumes. And we use just statistics to distribute the properties in 3G model, such as FCI. So the million dollar question is how to establish a reservoir donation. It is a task of enormous responsibility because it supports the production performance of an oil field. And there are two options to do that. Option A, connect similar well log pattern, assuming it is correlating the same rock unit. It is a little stratigraphic correlation. Let's suppose a project based on this donation to inject water in well two and produce oil from well one. The product is approved. Injection starts, but water injection in well two does not enhance the production of well one. What happens? We make the big boss angry. The poor team struggles to find a solution and then they interpret a fault. Oh, a subsigned fault. Despite the attempt, the project failed, money was lost, poor guys. Option B, the team with the same data, same wells, they propose a correlation that unravels the reservoir's special distribution. It is the geometry, connectivity, internal heterogeneities. This correlation tells us the reservoir's depositional history through time, and hence it is a chronostratigraphic correlation. So the correlation shows, shows that water injection on low two cannot enhance production in well one. Big boss is happy, everybody saves his money. But Magal, is it new in the industry? I mean, is chronostratigraphic correlation a new issue? No, it's not. Secret stratigraphy has been used during the last 40 years, mainly focused on exploration. This book is the historical memoir 26, published in 1979. But it is noteworthy that secret stratigraphy many principles came from a long time ago. However, high resolution secret stratigraphy 
is relatively new. The novelty is the reservoir scale chrono stratigraphic correlation to optimize production. This talk is most based on the ideas published in this paper, which can be downloaded for free directly from the magazine's website up to November 14th. However, the little stratigraphic approach is too current in many oil fields worldwide. Therefore, to optimize production, training is needed to update the conditioning from little to chronic stratigraphic approach. Today, I will emphasize some diagnostic features that indicate the opportunity to improve the reservoir donation based on high resolution seek stratigraphy, and hence to improve the production of oil fields. So, what does high resolution seek stratigraphy mean? To put it simply, it means the stratigraphic resolution below seismic resolution. I mean, what we can see from well logs, outcrops, and core that is not seen on seismic. If we are aware of the production, we must move from low resolution, seismic, to high resolution, reservoir scale. Note the thickness of this interval, 800 meters, too thick for the world. But why is it worth going to reservoir scale? First of all, because the rock record is fragmentary. According to Barrow, 1917, only one sixth of the geological time is preserved as rocks in the rock record. Hiatus account for six sixths of the time and are represented by stratigraphic surfaces. In turn, such surfaces stand for heterogeneities in breaks in the sedimentation pattern. From sand line, we cannot see details or heterogeneity that may impact the fluid flow in the production. Let's see those surfaces on an outcrop. Now, let's zoom in to show the vertical stacking of different deposits bound by those major low resolution surfaces in red, blue, and green. And at the right, we can see the heterogeneous, vertical heterogeneous, open marine shales in green that compartmentalize the strain reservoirs. From this image, we can imagine the impact of these heterogeneous on the flow of fluids. This is high resolution six stratigraphy. Therefore, if we identify high frequency sequences, we can demonstrate the reservoir spatial distribution and heterogeneities. It is the stratigraphic essence of 3D geological and fluid flow models in the oil industry. Traces associations, stocking pattern, exhibit TR cycles since Embry 1993 that are predictive, recurrent, and organized in an upward trend. Moreover, there are mappable in the study area. The mappability relates to the lateral analysis. I mean, the chronic stratigraph correlation, but the lateral extent depends on the sequence rank. So these are the criteria to identify high frequency sequences. The sequence stratigraph workflow in low frequency focuses on the identification of petroleum system elements. I mean, at exploration and seismic scale. The high resolution frequency sequence stratigraphy workflow aims the reservoir scale, I mean, below size resolution, because this is the scale of the main stratigraphic gap heterogeneous found in oil fields. Hence, the workflow of high resolution progress in two crucial steps for 3D geological and fluid flow modeling. Step four, building a stratigraphic gap framework that establish the reservoir donation. And step five, representing the reservoir external geometries and distribution of phase and petrophysical properties. Let's see an example of step three. 
This picture is a deep oriented design section shown in red in the map below. Core description support side interpretation and well known correlation. At this scale, we cannot see the details of the reservoir. However, let's zoom in in the interval between the wells 17 and 18. Secrecy one is approximately 200 meters thick in the location around the magnifier. Core description indicates through the deposits in the carbonate platform. And we can see the change of side interfaces in each system tracks, the yellow, the low stem, the green, the transgressive, and the blue, the high stem. So we can see there's no more regression of the low stem, the retrogradational pattern of the transgressive, and again, the normal regression of the high stem. The zigzag highlights the lateral facies contacts and points the regressive and transgressive depositional trends. Let's make the same correlation using well logs. So how can you correlate fluvial and carbonate deposits within the same time interval? An arbitrary line, transitional line, is not enough. And remember, we don't want to make the boss angry. Well, the sign interpretation indicated us where the limits are. I mean, the zigzags. So we bring the zigzags to the well log cross section and predict the reservoir occurrence. In this way, we define the depositional system that make up the low stem, the transgressive, and the high stem system tracks. However, pay attention. We are quite sure about the location of sequence stratigraphic surfaces that bound the system tract and the occurrence of reservoirs. However, there is some room for positioning the zigzags to the right or to the left. This interpretation details the system tracks, but not the reservoir and its heterogeneity to account for production. To do that, we need to refine the stratigraphy even more. We will see it soon in the case studies. Now let's see an example of step four. Step four at the reservoir scale. The upper figure shows a reservoir orange and yellow cells enveloped by shale, the green cells, which compose high frequent sequences. I mean, the reservoir donation. At step five, we must adjust the geological and fluid flow model. The distribution of properties in the geological model, such as porosity, permeability, oil saturation, etc., must support the production simulation without using artifacts in the simulator, such as permeability multipliers, impermeable layers, etc. The fine adjust between the geologic and fluid flow models is achieved when the simulated production matches the historical field of production. Adjusted models are then robust enough to forecast production and support production management and development project. Now, we will see some diagnostic features that indicate the need for stratigraphic refinement to optimize production. These features were observed in several producing oil fields. Tilted oil water contact. Even though it can happen in particular situation, tilted oil water contact very often results from misinterpretation. In this example, the wells are only nine, three meters apart. And the contact, this blue line here, is 10 meter, 10 meter lower in the well at the left. The lower figure shows the stratigraphic refinement of the same interval in which we recognize reservoir zones and two distinct contacts. The occurrence of different contacts helps to identify distinct zones. Very often, we face a random distribution of petrophysical properties 
through FZI or other joint statistical methods. In this case, how to predict the preferential fluid pass between wells. The lower figure shows the same reservoir after the ref stratigraphic refinement that constrains properties distribution within each zone. So we can see the preferential fluid paths and intervals for injection or production in the wells. Unexpected water production, I mean water breakthrough, is another example of diagnostic feature. In this example, in 2002, a horizontal oil water contact in blue limits the oil column in the anticline. We would expect uniform contact to rise due to production. However, in 2010, the side image indicated water fingering following the bed in plane, and hence the contact do not move as expected. This image shows us the reservoir is not homogeneous, but composed of different zones, each one with its faces and petrophysical properties. Nevertheless, this example indicates the need for stratigraphic refinement to allow production from the zones below and above the water saturated one. Besides, we must pay attention to the following diagnostic features. Geomechanical problems due to reservoir overpressure generally happen because we overestimate the permeability of the lateral extent of the zones subject to injection. Well drilling based on scientific anomaly, not calibrated with the positional model of the current stratigraphic framework. Remember, Signed anomalies not always mean reservoir with good porosity. Well crossing unforeseen zones or unexpected fluids indicate we don't know the reservoir spatial distribution. If the simulated curve, production curve, does not match the historic observed data, we must review the distribution of phase in petrophysical properties within the zones. But remember, one must not use artifacts to force the simulator to get such matching. And finally, the production forecast based on unadjusted geological and fluid flow models inevitably leads to considerable deviation between prediction and observed production resulting in financial wealth. Well, now we're gonna see the first case stud that is a successful example of reservoir based, reservoir donation based on high resolution. The reservoirs consist of mixed shallow marine sandstone overlain by shallow marine shale and carbonates, which are Albion in age. The field has an area of 10 square kilometer, a volume of oil in place of 63 million barrels. And in 2005, well space was around 200 liters. Production started in 1992, raising to a peak followed by a dramatic decline. The cycle repeated from 2000 to 2005 due to new drillings that confirmed several fluid contacts. Production was a steep decline toward the economic field cutoff in 2005, whereas water cut was soaring. The last drill the wells crossed unpredicted zones with or without hydrocarbons that did not fit in the established reservoir zonation. The field was considered mature, and that question, that question arose. Has the time come for field abandonment due to low production? Or what are we to do? The company decided to make a reward study based on high resolution methodology 
to review the reservoir donation and support a new drilling program. But what is the first thing to do in our reservoir study? Hmm, that's a good question. The answer is go back to the rocks. A detailed core description revealed the reservoirs consist of a cyclic record of low stand and transgressive shallow marine sandstone enveloped by transgressive shallow marine shale and carbonate. The cyclic pattern is a response of regress class overloading that triggered salt displacement on the subsurface. The salt motion created topographic lows that were flooded in favored shale and carbonate deposition. The impedance contract between carbonate and sandstone promoted mappable reflectors that characterize 40 to 80 meter thick TR cycles recognized in sand line. These are the donation supported several well interventions that stabilized the field production. This result confirmed an improvement to the reservoir donation, but further stratigraphic refinement was required to go below the size resolution to understand the production behavior. High frequency cycles, 1.5 to 15 meter thick TR cycles, composed of sandstone carbonate intervals, were observed in cores and wellos. And look, some of them were saturated in water. So in addition to a new fuel drilling, the company launched a campaign of workovers focused on squeezing water saturated zone, increasing perforation in existing open oil saturated zone, and open new zone to production. The new perforated intervals exhibit original pressure in producing the oil through the natural flow to the surface, although with rapid depletion. From 2007 to 2015, the high frequency donation triggered the field rejuvenation with an additional production of 1.7 million barrels of oil. This volume represents a substantial gain of 23% in the cumulative production up to 2005. An impressive increase in 5% in the oil recovery factor. And more importantly, this production during the rejuvenation phase provided a surplus of approximately $85 million in the period, or approximately $9 million every single year. The second case study refers to the application of high resolution thick stratigraphy in lactogen carbonate from the Balbuena for sequence in the South Basin, Argentina. The Balbuena for sequence consists of 15 to 70 meter thick TR cycles composed of a basal shale interval overlain by carbonates. And the cycles are bound by subaero unconformities. The ideal and complete high frequency cycle suggests accommodation. I mean, the lake level was ultimately controlled by the ratio between precipitation in P and evaporation E ratios. A high PE ratio indicates wet climate leading to the rise of phreatic and the lake level and an increase in regional influx. On the other hand, a low PE ratio implies a dry climate triggering phreatic in lake level fall, substantial reduction of the original influx, and the establishment of a suitable environment for carbonate formation. The period of lake expansion in blue is equivalent to transgression, which is characterized by the position of fine grain sediments in green and mar in blue. The TST finished at the NES, a surface that is equivalent to 
to the maximum flooding surface, which is placed at the contact between the transgressive model and the regressive carbonates. The photos below show the high frequency sequences as they appear in outcrops. The NES also marked an important break in sedimentation style. During NES, a necessary lag time is required for the lake water becoming clear. The lake bottom surface turns into a semi-consolidated substrate and the carbonate factor starts working. The lag time is one fundamental factor that explains the higher productivity of the carbonate factor during regression in this lake setting. The dynamics of the carbonate factor in salt -like, in salt lake type is then quite different from that observed in shallow marine settings. The shallow marine carbonate factor has its maximum efficiency during the high step, while carbonate production is minimal alongside transgressive, low stem, and falling stage system tracks. During regression, sediment accumulation outpaces accommodation and triggers the progradation of microbial columns toward the lake center, while the desiccation features develop step by step on the top of exposed carbonate phase all around the lake margin, the red line. So let's see a six kilometer long cross section based on outcrops represented by the white line in this map. The vertical recurrence of the vertical recurrence as well the trend exhibited by high frequency uh, sequences determine higher rank sequences that are mappable all over the basin. The bulk end of our sequence is an analog of Brazilian pre salt reservoir. Thus, the method developed in salt basin was applied to the 2P oil field. The pre salt and salt intervals represent the side phase of the Santos basin. The reservoirs belong to Baravelha unit, and 100 wells supported this reservoir donation. Three elementary cycles were recognized from core. They are thin, less than two meters thick, and bound by subaeron conformities. From the bottom to the top, cycle one is formed of graystone, backstone, and shrubs. The lack of mud intervals suggests formation under high energy conditions. Cycle two consists of greenstone, backstone, mudstone, and filled with magnesium clay and shrubs. The presence of mud interval indicates low energy conditions, whereas chemical precipitates suggest an increase in alkalinity and high evaporation precipitation ratio. Finally, cycle three is composed of greenstone, Backstone, madstone with organic matter, and microbial laminite, spherulid, and discrete shrubs. The occurrence of thicker mud interval than cycles one and two points to more frequency marine incursions. These characteristics suggest high frequency lake level fluctuation under a low gradient substrate and alternation of flooding and subaerial exposure period. The comparison between the cycles observed in the salt basin and the pre-salt highlights the same deposition pattern and the stocking pattern logic. Moreover, the elementary cycles were observed all over the Boravelha unit. The recurrence supported by Fisher plots in Markov chain and upward trend enabled the identification of a small scale sequences between two to eight meters thick. 
Although with limited mappability, this sequence composed medium scale sequence that are 10 to 40 meters thick and mappable all over the field. In turn, medium scale composed the large scale sequence. Following the trend imposed by high frequency GR cycles, the top of regressive carbonate exhibit shrubs with good permaporosities and dissolution features such as verbs, karsts, caves that characterize the best reservoir. In contrast, the TST consists of fine grained faces with low permaporosity that mark the zone boundaries. Therefore, the medium scale sequences established the reservoir donation of the 2P oil field. Currently, 2P is the top five largest offshore field of the world, according to Offshore Technology Magazine. Its remarkable production of 1.3 million equivalent oil barrels a day, or one million barrels a day, results from, among other factors, the production strategies based on the reservoir donation characterization supported by high resolution seek stratigraphy applied to large stream carbonate settings. So the application of the high resolution undoubtedly optimizes hydrocarbon carbon hydrocarbon production by determining flow units within a chronic stratigraphic reservoir donation and characterization, which in turn constrains the distribution of phase association in the properties. The 3D geological and fluid flow models must be adjusted so that the simulated production honors the observed historical data. Adjusted model are robust to forecast production and support the reservoir in production management and to implement development production projects. And some diagnostic features sign on the opportunity to refine the reservoir donation. In green fields, high resolution identifies the best reservoir for production and economic return. This is a photo of P66, an FPSO unit that starts production in 2010 into P field and it can daily process 150,000 barrels a day and compress 6 million cubic meters of gas, according to Petrobras. In bow fields, high resolution guides to identify washed zones and oil zones not yet drained that promotes an increase of production that marks a new phase of field rejuvenation. It's noteworthy that a field rejuvenation depends on robust geology. No engineering project, no engineering project can solve geological problems. I would like to finish this talk paraphrasing Professor Dixon, who said that rocks stay the same. What changes is the way we interpret them. The way we interpret the stratigraphic record here presented results from the cooperation of dedicated professionals with whom I have the privilege to work with and to whom I express my deepest gratitude. Thank you, guys. Besides, I'd like to thank AAPG for the opportunity and thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Magal. I'm sure that this was a great value to all participants. This presentation was excellent. So from this moment, we will start with the questions and answer rounds. This will be last approximately 30 minutes. And during this time, you can continue sending your dots. So, okay, Mara, for the moment, my, my we didn't. Not... Uh, your video? Yeah. 
Mm, yes. No, I can see you. <laughs> oh, now I can see you. Okay. Okay, thank you. So in this moment, we don't have questions yet. We wait a couple of minutes. Okay. So I have a, a question, Magal, to yes. incent incentivize another question. <laughs> so Magal, machine learning techniques are used to high resolution stratigraphy? Well, I think so. Even though I have never heard a paper about this, but I'm sure there are people working on that. Uh, remember that we have already some software that uh, try to reproduce the positional process. And uh, in doing so, this process must be able to identify intervals that makes the zone boundaries. Remember that the positional um, process, sedimentary process, the same sedimentary process that make up the deposits are responsible for this, the sequence stratigraphy sequences. So I think that artificial intelligence is playing a big, important role on this, on this matter. Okay, my God. we have uh, one question. In high resolution sequence stratigraphy, just useful only for exploration phase, what is the role of this uh, technique in development phase of exploration and production project? What about mature fields? Yeah, maybe I was not clear. What I meant was, Secret stratigraphy starts and has been on the wage for at least 40 years. But at seismic scale, at exploration scale, we do not talk about high resolution. We only talk about high resolution when we go beyond, below the sign resolution. So right, the high resolution is focused on reservoir scale, especially in major fields. The example I showed today of a major field that had improved the oil, oil recovery factor by 5% and gave a surplus of $85 million in the period. What is exactly this, exactly this. High resolution is very well uh, suitable for major fields. But I would say that me, even in green fields and new fields, when the, the team proposed the first zonation, the first reservoir zonation, they must be working or they must work with the cars, with the logs, and therefore a step further to low resolution, from low resolution to high resolution. So high resolution is special applicable to reservoir studies, not for exploration studies. And uh, this study high resolution can be done, can be carried out both in green or in major fields. Okay, Magal, we have a message for Junia Casagrande. Great talk, Magal. Thank you for showing us the application of high resolutions, sequence stratigraphy in our production in a such uncompressive way. Thank Thanks you very much. It was a great presentation, Maya. So apparently we don't have more. Ah. Okay, we have one question of Amanda Johnston. Great talk. Can you discuss with one of your examples that you show with today, the key observation that helped you to define between high stance and low stance systems? Also, can you discuss how you use these observations and background knowledge of the stratigraphy to most explain production? Okay. The first question about recognizing the system tracks. Well, system tracks are recognized 
once you recognize the sequence stratigraphic surface. When you break your succession into uh, system tracks, you must use stratigraphic surface to bound them. And the main, the main, let's say, character of this these uh, transgressive or regressive system tracks is the stacking pattern. The stacking pattern, regressive stacking pattern, is completely different from the transgressive stacking pattern. So if you have transgressive stacking pattern and above it, conformably, or at least without erosion, another regressive stacking pattern, the difference from transgress retrogradational to regressive progradation marks the bound between the TST and the high stem. So I think the, the first question is answered. What can I say about boost in production? Well, if you identify the reservoir within a chronostratograph framework, you must identify the best reservoir, I mean, the, the one that has porosity permeability for production. I'm talking about conventional reservoir, right? And of course, fine grain strata, most of the time are not good reservoir. Whereas sand or sandy, porous sand, high energy are normally related to the best reservoir. So if you understand the stacking pattern and the location of these deposits, the sedimentary deposits, within this chronostratigraphic framework, you would be able to identify the reservoirs, their connectedness, their external geometry, and the, uh, the heterogeneities represented by stratigraphic surfaces, for instance, maximum flooding surface related to fine grain sediments on top of regressive, transgressive strata. And therefore, you can choose intervals that were not draining. They still have original oil in pressure um, on your field. And then you can boost production simply by squeezing water saturated intervals and open new, never opened before oil zones to product. So like this, if you do like this, you repeat the successful experience we had in Brazil, in the small, country, small, small oil field, Santa Luzia, and get that get a surplus, considerable surplus of $90 million a year. I think I answered your question, Amanda. Okay, Magal, we have more questions from Mauro Baker. Great talk, Magal, thank you very much. Uh, can you say a few words about the diagenetic effects on the uh, high resolution sequence stratigraphy? And can high resolution be used to constrain diagenetic heterogeneities over print? Yeah, Mauro, that's a good question. Most of the time, diagenesis happens in situations that are inherited from the positional process. I mean, there are some kind of control on diagenesis, and uh, the intervals very well cemented or impermeable layer, uh, they inherit some some control from the depositional process. In this sense, if diagenesis coincides with this uh, situation, these intervals related to the positional process that marks boundaries between different stacking patterns, then even though they are diagenetically modified, cemented or no, the same uh, approach uh, can be used. Diagenesis may enhance the C 
steel capacity of a layer that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't be a zone layer. But this must be related to some depositional process to be mappable. Uh, the genetic features that occur random in the reservoir cannot be mapped. We, have, we don't have control on that. And uh, to finish this uh, explanation, I'm not talking about comprehensive diagenetic events that may, for instance, dolomatize the entire layer of carbonate, for instance. No, I'm talking about the control that the positional process have on promoting stratigraphic surface that in turn controls the occurrence or the location of diagenetic events and therefore make promoting um, boundary for reservoir uh, zonation. Okay, Maya, the next question is from Ixan Novrain. Usually, in what kind of depositional environments this method can effectively improve reservoir understanding? I would say the method is universal. Uh, of course, the best place to study sequence stratigraphy is uh, close to the shoreline or the Pella shoreline. Nevertheless, we can use the same approach uh, for a huge, a wide uh, number of depositional systems uh, with, with success. I mean, when you talk about downstream control or the positional system that are controlled somehow by the fluctuation of the transgressive and regressive events, uh, we can use this approach uh, universally. And if you move, so, for, for instance, for inter mountains areas or climate tectonic controlled areas, like the carbonate setting we saw today in Salta Basin, we still have controls to apply the methodology. So I'd say there is no a special or particular environment or the positional system that is not uh, suitable for this, for this method. I would say they can be used in every, every single depositional system with success. You must pay attention, must pay attention to the controls on sedimentation that promotes the stacking patterns. That's the key, the stacking patterns. If you do that, you can uh, successfully apply the methodology. Okay, we have, Magal, we have one question more from Fosia Abdullah. Thank you for your talk. Uh, how can we apply this concept if there is dolomitization? Yeah, this question is quite similar to that one, the first one about the genetic features. Well, if dolomitization is very, very, very comprehensive, I mean, we have no um, possibility to connect the cementation events to the stratigraphic surface, so the method cannot be applied. If the reservoir is completely cemented from the top to the bottom, several meters, 100 meters, the method cannot be applied because the hygiene may say hamper the method by not allowing understand the, the, the stacking pattern. However, if the, the dolomitization follows some depositional process control, I mean, coincides or is close to sedimentary uh, secret stratigraphic surface, this feature will not hamper the method. In fact, this feature would help to establish the reservoir donation because they may be associated with seals that in turn is associated to some kind of short gap surface. Okay, 
Okay, Megan, we didn't have more questions. So once again, thank you very much for the excellent presentation, for the excellent talk. And thank you all for participating in our program, Tuesday Talks with APG.